reminding you of the basis of this, Romans 15, 4. And I turn to the passage. Now, I'm not going to read verses 22 through 29, but I will mention what's there. I urge you to note it. As we look at the text, then we see the children of Israel were in their wilderness wandering. Moses, as you know, a type of Christ, had been chosen to lead them out of Egyptian bondage. That bondage was a type of alien sins, as far as we're concerned today. They're being passing through under God's direction of the Red Sea. Paul used that in the New Testament to say they were all baptized under Moses in the, in the sea. But then they began to wander and because of sin. God caused all 20 years old and upward to die in that 40 years except Caleb and Joshua. You'll remember Aaron's place in all of this, that he was Moses' mouthpiece during this time. We also remember that uh, Aaron was ordained the first high priest of the Jewish economy. But, as is true of all of us, Aaron's time on earth was limited. And so now in the passage, if you've been reading any of it, you'll notice that it's time for Aaron to die. Numbers 33-39 tells us that at the time of his death, that he was 123 years old. Well, let's look at this and look at these lessons from the death of Aaron. First of all, as I said, enumerating what we wanted to emphasize, that God takes sin seriously. The death of Aaron occurred at this time, and we usually don't associate this as far as Aaron. We usually associate it with Moses. But God puts the failure at the waters of Meribah to be a part of Moses' problem as well as Aaron's problem. And if you look back at verses 6 through 16, you will see the account of where Moses was to speak to the rock and he struck it with his staff. And though it does not mention specifically about Aaron's part in this, God does say plainly that it was because of the matters of Meribah. Look at verse 24. Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. Why, Lord? Because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Of course, Moses didn't eat it. So we know God being a perfectly just God, that Aaron wasn't being punished just because of Moses, but that he had a part in the matter. So he wasn't allowed to go over in the land of promise. His office then was to be placed upon his son, or we may say it this way better, his son was to take his office as high priest, and thus God had ordained that Moses take Eleazar, his son, that is Aaron's son, and Aaron, and they go up to the Mount Hor. There Moses was to strip the priestly garments off of Aaron and put them on Eleazar, and there Aaron would die. And this should show us, among other things in the Bible, that God takes our transgressions of his will, for sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. Very serious. Isaiah 59 and verse 2, the great prophet, tells us plainly, but your, infer your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, so he will not hear. So when we sin, we must pay the penalty. That doesn't mean when we are forgiven of our sins that the consequences of it here on earth are just completely wiped away. If a little innocent baby takes a hairpin and sticks it into an outlet, it's going to get shot. It transgresses natural law. No matter how innocent it is, it suffers the consequences. <coughs> Electrician who's well trained makes a mistake. 
suffer the consequences. Sin is against natural law. You jump off this building, I don't care how much you identify with the bird wanting to fly, you hit the ground because of the law of gravity. Your identification with the bird doesn't make you a bird. It's as simple as to me, but if you think about the world today, not simple seems to be rejected. So God takes sin seriously. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God, Romans 6, 23. When you look at Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven, are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. I believe that this nation believes that when it comes to abortion and the abuse of little children who are innocent before God. But notice, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. What does that do to all the people who are devising ways to rob you, whether they're legal or not, or devising ways to take somebody else's property that doesn't belong to them? They're devising ways to hurt people and they don't care about it. He says, feet that are swift in running to mischief. There are people who look for every opportunity they can to better themselves, no matter what it does, somebody else. A lot of the thievery in this whole area, any place, but especially the big city, are thieves or error or evil of opportunity. They didn't go out this morning to steal your lawnmower. When they go down the street and they see it sitting there all by itself, they have a pickup truck, they're going to grab it and stick it in there. Why? Because they are a thief at heart, and they're going to take advantage of it. A false witness that speaketh lies, that lies an untruth. And if you're a liar, you tell it knowing it's a lie to deceive somebody else by making them believe it's the truth. There are plenty of people like that in the world. It may be that we've come to believe, well, people just can't be that way. But they are. And the Bible tells us so. So a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. That's a sin. Go to hell with things like this. There's no way you can get all upset at those other five things the Lord hates and not get upset with those who sow discord among men. You see the list that he put those in. And thus, he means what he says and says what he means. Whether you believe it or whether I believe it. So we should take sin seriously. Psalm 97, verse 10 reads, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Again, I say, I don't know anybody believes that you can hate anything. But he says to hate evil. How could a person who wears the name of Christ, which means of Christ, love any evil, have any attachment with evil? In Psalm 119, 104, through thy precepts I get understanding. Now there's where the problem is. It's through thy precepts we get understanding. Look at the conclusion. Therefore, I hate every false word question we must ever ask ourselves do we in Proverbs 8 13 the fear of the Lord is to hate evil pride arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate well I don't think we have a problem with this and that it's written in such a way it's just so difficult for understanding in fact I think the problem a lot of us have with it is because we do understand it God's plain here. He says what he meant, he meant what he said. And we must realize that. When you look at Aaron, remembering all that he did, then these things make it clear that as members of the Lord's church, or if you're outside of Christ and need to be forgiven of sins to become a Christian by obedience to the gospel, then we need to know God don't go just overlook you because this, that, and the other that you've done. It may be very good, but if you want to obey the gospel, you're still lost. We also have a better high priest than was Aaron. Now, he was the first high priest among the children of Israel. Look at this 8 12 in chapter 21, verse 10. He it was, as was the duty of all high priests, was to go once a year into the most holy place or the holy of holies, to sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice, the blood of atonement, each year on the mercy seat, on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, to 
between the cherubim. Exodus 30, verse 10. Scripture tells us that he offered that for himself and for all the people. Well, he had to offer that for himself. He was a human being. But he was a type of pride. He foreshadowed the pride. But even Aaron died. I often say, study the book of Hebrews closely when you're studying the Old Testament, especially the law of Moses. I understand that system of types and shadows and better understand how that we can find comfort and strength and hope as we study the Old Testament scriptures. The writer of Hebrews said in chapter 7, verses 22 through 27, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continued with ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. But then notice from that same New Testament epistle, Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Thus, we have a much, much better high priest today. The Lord's church is a temple, a place of worship, as it is a vineyard is a place of worship. And we need to understand then that Christ himself, Paul said to Timothy, the only mediator between God and man is the man Christ Jesus, who ever lives to make intercession for us. He intercedes on our behalf at his father's throne. Then we need to know why he's a better high priest. He's as much man as you are and I am. And thus, being tempted in every point like as we are, he can empathize, sympathize with us. He can plead our case before the court of heaven and before his father. Because he knows what it's like to be a man and to live here as a man. But it is appointed unto men once to die. Now, just who was Aaron? Well, you would have to say he was a leader of the Israelites. We know from the text, and knew it earlier, no doubt, that he was a brother of Moses. He was the mouthpiece of Moses as he spoke. He was a high priest. But as I said in the introductory matters, he was still a man, and it was appointed unto him to die. And our text is dealing with that death of old man of war as ordained by God as the high priest's robes were taken off of him and placed on his son, Eliezer. Now, listen to this. Genesis 3, verse 19. This is pertaining to all men because of sin. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and in the dust thou shalt return. He planted it. No escaping death. In Job 30 and verse 23, he said, For I know that thou wilt bring me to death, and to the house appointed for all living. In Psalm 90 and verse 10, the psalm is recorded. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if they, by reason of strength, are four score years, yet is the strength, labor, and sorrow, what is soon cut off, and we fly away. Of 
course, we discussed this sometime earlier in the sermon. Hebrews 9, 27, we quoted already, and it is appointed unto men once to die. And our emphasis now is the death of Aaron. But another verse from the psalm, Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. How wonderful it would be for the church in its spiritual growth and development if each person would number his days. See them that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. For the days are evil. <coughs> but then we need to learn from this study of the death of Aaron that we are to weep with those who weep. You will notice that when all the congregation of Israel had heard that Aaron was dead, they mourned for him 30 days. Now, you know as well as I do that death affects every single person on the face of this earth. Over nearly 55 years of preaching, I suppose I've seen it about every way possible. Not every way, but about every way. And numerous times have stood by the bed as one breathed his last. I remember one lady who was well over her 90s, well into her 90s. I remember visiting with her. She was a sister in Christ. It was very interesting to visit with her because at that time, which was over 40 years ago, that she was in her early 90s. This little girl, if you don't know Western history, out of Fort Smith and over in Oklahoma Indian Territory, she remembered seeing Bell Star. And you just have to look that up. It would be like saying Bonnie and Clyde, the people today, in some sense. I guess you know who that is. Uh, but Bell Star riding in Fort Smith, so she can tell some, uh, some interesting stories. And with Maggie Murphy, I think you can tell the origin of her of her bloodline if you know anything about the Irish. But here's what's interesting: Jesus was tempted at every point like as we are, yet without sin. But as a man, he still died. Now he did not die because he was guilty of any sin. He died as the Lamb of God, pure and holy, having been tempted in every point like we are, yet without sin. Thus he could die on our behalf, and thus serve as a sacrifice, his body, for our sin, and his blood shed for the remission of our sin. Perhaps the most tender verse, at least it's one among a few, in all the scriptures is this. At the tomb of Lazarus, before he raised him from the dead, he saw all the people weeping. And two little words describe the Lord as he viewed that scene in John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. He was a man, and he sympathized with people. The Bible says that Jesus was made like his brethren. The Hebrews writer says in chapter 2, verse 17, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. I read that and stop and think about it for a minute. He's made like me. He's a human being. And why was that the case? John 1, 14 says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Well, when he became man, he became flesh, as the scripture says here by the pen of the Hebrew writer, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. And for what end? To what end? To make reconciliation for the sin of the people. Reconciliation is a great study. The doctrine of reconciliation. Be ye reconciled to God. You know, God didn't leave us. We left God by sinning against him. God never did us any ill. Never went back on the promise. But countless times men have, when it comes to their promises to God, their disobedience to him. So being separated from God, how do you get them back together? God's high and holy and they're not tainted with sin in any form or fashion to any degree. Well, Jesus made that possible. 
because he became a man and as a man overcame sin and through him we are reconciled to God. Our sins are washed away. And thus we can stand before the Lord just as if we had never sinned. Romans 12, 13, the Apostle Paul penned, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that reap. It may be a lot easier for us to rejoice with them that rejoice than to weep with them that weep. Nevertheless, that's part of being faithful to the Lord and our duty toward one another. Galatians 6.10 says, As you therefore have opportunity to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, I suggest to you doing good unto all men, and the fact that he said especially those of the household of faith means that we can empathize, sympathize with those who are not Christians when they suffer. Our Lord did. And it's one of the great ways we have of letting our light shine and influence for good to show people who have situations and circumstances where people don't care about them. I think we would be surprised if we knew the people just in a five-mile radius who really feel like they're totally alone and they don't want to do about it. I think our Lord would do what he could to reach those people with the gospel and show them sympathy and empathy and understanding. God shows no partiality to men. Now we noticed who Aaron was. High priest, brother of Moses, spokesperson for Moses. Obviously, he was beloved of the people. They mourned him for 30 days, a great leader. But he died. The sin which Aaron committed was not excused because of his position, because of his power, or because of his prestige. Deuteronomy 10, 17 reads, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward. And then we're all familiar with the scenes Luke gave us, the household of Cornelius, the first uncircumcised Gentile convert, in Acts chapter 10, 34, he records, Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive, I wish everybody perceived what he perceived, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Brethren, I read quite a bit. I read as much as I can, keeping up with current events. I've done that all my life. I've always enjoyed it. And I've watched since a child all this business of civil rights, of this, that, and the other, of discrimination, of bias. All of that can be cured. And you don't have to go to Harvard to get a Ph.D. in social work to do it. If you just listen to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even also unto them. That would stop all discrimination immediately. It doesn't mean that you have to like a person in the sense of he's going to be your best buddy. But you're going to treat him by doing unto him what you would have him do unto you. And you'll never abuse him. You'll always show respect toward him or her. You'll never put them down, make light of them because of their race, because they're poor, because of their ethnicity, because they don't measure up to maybe the blessings God's poured out on you in your life to where you know, you're just kind of better than everybody else. I don't know where we get that idea since we wear the name Christian. But it could all be stopped that quick if people would just put into practice what we call, and rightly so, the golden rule. Romans 2.11, for there is no respect of persons with God. Can't get plainer than that. In 1 Peter 1 verse 17, and if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, Past the time of your sojourning here in fear. 
People talk about, well, I'm just passing the time. Well, here's the way Christians have passed the time. As pilgrims who fear God. Well, if you fear God, the Ecclesiastes writer says your whole duty is to keep his commandments. <coughs> so you pass your time keeping his commandments. Because this life's meant to get ready for heaven. And to use as God intended, I don't know any other way to get ready for heaven. In the pass the time in fear of God and keeping his commandments. Now if somebody else wants to tell me any other way to pass the time, as God accepts it, guides us to pass the time, let me know. But I've never found it in all these years. Aaron's forgiveness was without partiality as well. It came through the same source that we are forgiven. Only he had to look forward to the day of its happening, the shed blood of Christ on the cross, because the power that's in the blood to save went backwards as it did forward. The only reason the law of Moses saved any of those people because it was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ, Galatians 3, 3, 4, and what Christ did on that cross. So as they were faithful in the law of Moses, and the blood of Christ went back to cleanse them. Same is true of Abraham's patriarchal age. As they were faithful to whatever God expected of them to do in the patriarchal age, the blood of Christ went back and cleansed them. Now we look back at the actual shed blood of Christ almost 2,000 years ago. And how do we uh, procure that cleansing blood? How can it be applied to me? By faith, as it was to all of them under the law that affected them. But now we have the perfect law of liberty, a system of grace through faith and thus we have the blood of Christ in obedience to the gospel applied to us as we're baptized into his death being believers who repent of our sins and confess our faith prior to our baptism in Hebrews 9 12 through 15 he makes it clear that under the Old Testament system the law of Moses neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once unto the holy place having obtained eternal redemption and for this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now how are we called? Why is the gospel called? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. Why does it call anybody? Why is the power of God to salvation? Romans 1, 16. Why Paul wasn't ashamed of it. No matter how people, how many people look down on him because of that, he wasn't ashamed of it because it's the way God saves. God has chosen the weak things of this world, the beggarly things of this world, to confound the wise. That was Naaman's problem. He had leprosy, it was incurable. He thought there'd be some big show put on. Yet God, through the prophet and by the prophet's servant, Gehazi, sent him out and said, the only thing you've got to do go down and dip seven times in the river Jordan. That simple statement was too much for him. He was going to be angry. Aren't you glad you've had people that would persuade you to do what you knew you ought to do anyway? And he had servants who did. And lo and behold, when he did that simple act from the heart, seven times dipping in the river Jordan, when he came up that seventh time, Scripture says his flesh came to him as a little child. Well, you bring that over from 2 Kings 5 to today, and what do we have? We have simple trusting obedience to the Lord's word. We take God at his word. We don't argue with it. We don't complain about it. We make sure we understand the message. We make sure that it's applied to us, and we humbly submit to it. With an attitude expressed in the words of speak, Lord, I serve it here. Command, and I will obey. Marvelous. Develop your soul to think that way, and you'll always be what God wants you to be because you'll always do what he said. I never will forget hearing in a recorded sermon old brother Marshall Keeble died back in 1968, describing faith. And, of course, faith comes from hearing the word of God. He said, now, if God were to speak to me and say, Marshall, you jump right through that wall. He said, if it was the time on earth when God did things like that, then my faith would be demonstrated when I jumped through that wall. He said, it'd be up to me to jump. God would make the hole. In other words, you don't worry about the consequences of something. When God said do it and you understand it, then you just do it. 
God will take care of everything else. Can you think of, I'll say Seth over here, wherever he is right there. Uh, can you imagine him, how trusting he is in his mom and dad? But now imagine, if you put him as a grown person, just think of it that way, but think of his little children like that doing it. It's innocent as they can be, pure as they can be. And you were to say, now jump to daddy. He would say, now wait a minute, how do I know that you're going to catch me? Now I might ask that question too if I was Eric and I said, now Eric, jump to me, I'm going to catch you. If I were Eric, I'd say, oh, well, <laughs> we'll both go down. But you see the point I'm making. Before God, if we really have faith in Him and all the Bible defines faith to be, then God says, jump and I'll catch you. You have a word about it. He will. But He expects you to have such faith as you will do what He said and the way He said it and for the reason He said it. So we learn from the death of Aaron that God takes him seriously. That we have a better high priest that it's appointed unto men once to die, that we should weep with those that weep, and that God shows no partiality toward men. All men become Christians today the same way that everybody else becomes Christians, as we've studied in this lesson. So I hope this little study of Aaron's death in Numbers 20, 22 through 29 has helped us and bolstered us up, strengthened us as to what it means to live on this earth and serve God faithfully. If you're not a Christian this afternoon, you have now this opportunity. You may not have another. Someday you won't. To obey the gospel as we've studied. As a child of God, did you learn anything that would help you be more faithful to God in the Lord's church? I hope so. If you already knew these things, did it strengthen you in those areas? Did it make you more mindful of spending time with the Bible and prayer, concerns of the Lord's kingdom? and getting ready for that day when we all must meet our maker. If you need to repent of sins and confess them before God, then pray to him for forgiveness, then don't let Satan fool you that you'll have another opportunity. You, you don't know that. And that would be a demonstration of lack of faith on your part and lack of love if you let that work. But if you need to obey the truth in any way, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.